Yeah, so, uh, so CrunchDAO, um, we are a platform uh, connecting uh, thousands of data scientists with financial institutions. So the idea is to have this uh, intermediate object that connects a lot of, and we have more slides after, uh, a lot of uh, technically uh, skilled people, uh, potentially from uh, uh, different fields that are interested in uh, uh, providing solutions uh, for financial problems that uh, are characterizing uh, financial institutions, of course. Uh, I guess we already introduce ourselves. Uh, um, uh, if I can say something about, let's say, the non-machine learning part of my background is that I applied it uh, for uh, optimal decision making, optimal control in uh, uh, space debris collision avoidance, so in orbital mechanics. Um, and this has many similarities with uh, at least modern portfolio theory. But uh, the idea is that you have a system, you collect data, uh, you assume there is some noise associated to this data. Uh, you want to have a model that defines how this, uh, the system underlying the uh, data generating process behaves. And from these uh, building blocks, then you want to build an optimal decision-making system that allows you to move uh, in, a, in the best way, defined in some sense. And so these two things characterize both the world of quantitative finance and uh, optimal control more in general. Uh, I'll try to, to, to speak as a, uh, uh, generically as possible about this, uh, these topics. Um, but so, yeah, uh, more practically, and John can, can stop me on this, uh, we are a, a, a growing community of uh, machine learning enthusiasts and uh, uh, experts, actually, uh, among the 5,000 members, 600 of these have a PhD uh, um, uh, from non other countries. And as I said, the background is really diverse. Uh, of course, there are many machine learning engineers, uh, quant, uh, 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 people, so people working uh, in the more traditional quantitative finance field, but also different fields, uh, more diverse, going from uh, theoretical physics to uh, pure mathematics, uh, statistical mechanics, and so on. Um, here, I will leave the floor to John. Uh, let me just say that, as I introduced, that the idea is to uh, put together two needs. One is this uh, ability of researchers to provide uh, intellectual property uh, in a way that uh, maintains the ownership of this uh, intellectual property and uh, and obtain rewards uh, with these uh, abilities, which you're all developing in this class, I guess, I mean, among others. Uh, and on the other financial institutions, uh, you, you probably already know that these institutions uh, have access to data that they cannot afford to share. Uh, and so it's really uh, key for them to maintain the privacy of this representation of the financial markets. But still, uh, they are aware that this inertia that's necessary uh, leads to some inefficiencies, which means they cannot get the best out of their uh, uh, data sets, let's say. And so CrunchDAO proposes itself as an in-between to provide value. I don't know if, John, you want to add something on this? No, 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 it's very clear. Maybe one thing is that, yeah, you're developing these skills right now. You are building. Uh, a unique way to look at the problems, right? It's intellectual property that you are building. And after a certain number of years, you will have these unique skills and you will put yourself in the position to get the best out of these skills, right? This is a natural uh, behavior that is very efficient. And if you could uh, use your machine learning skills and provide it to financial institutions, uh, you could really leverage these skills and, and have a uh, 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 a very nice outcome out of it on the top of maybe another job that you could have uh, uh, on the side or some research if some of you goes into the uh, a research career. Um, we have a real focus on financial institution right now. We're trying to solve uh, this problem of applying machine learning to, to, to finance. And that's really what the community is trying to do. And we try to, to show you right now, um, maybe if you go to the next slide, there is this program for today. So first of all, we have been spending the last two and a half years trying to think about uh, why and how machine learning fails in finance. Many of those concepts uh, will probably sound quite, uh, quite, quite, uh, 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 maybe you already know about it, I mean, but uh, it will be nice to do another pass on top of it. And then we're going to see how we how did how did we frame uh, the problem to solve this uh, using collective intelligence, game theory, uh, and 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 mathematics? Uh, and uh, I guess at the end uh, the goal will be to 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 let you 
see how at, and understand one way to solve this problem, uh, which is the, the, the way we developed all together. Thank you, Jean. So uh, we, we start in this uh, counter argument perspective in which we want to first underline all the points for which machine learning is a dangerous tool to use in, uh, in finance. Uh, but I would say more in general, uh, uh, why nonlinear modeling is a dangerous perspective to, to take to solve uh, complex systems. Um, but first, uh, let me ask you, what do you see about the common points between these three figures? So we try to get out of you our perspective, or at least we try. So we have an avalanche, uh, Tesla stock price from last year, and uh, our presentation of the climate. Any feedback? There's sufficient variables to create chaos. So it's hard to predict what's going to happen next. Cool. This makes me really happy. Uh, <laughs> anyone else? Anyone else wants to add something? How many sensors would we need to understand the, the behavior of the systems? Many, and uh, I, I would say this is uh, probably the, the main uh, uh, cutting. I mean, what you said about chaos is definitely true, but the most interesting aspect of uh, these systems, which are complex systems, is that together with having a nonlinear and therefore chaotic nature, they're also highly dimension high dimensional, uh, and this makes it makes them more interesting than purely chaotic systems like the double pendulum or uh, whatever you can think of. Um, uh, the idea is that not only you have chaos, but because you have uh, chaos at the low level, th these particles, uh, let's say, th these dimensions evolve in a way that lead to emergent properties, among which self-organization. So an avalanche uh, is a collection of snow particles moving, yes, but at the higher level of abstraction, it's something else that, uh, in some sense, disconnects from the the. the the physical principles that guide the motion of individual particles. Uh, so th this is the, I think, the interesting connection. That, sorry, the interesting difference between purely chaotic dynamics and complex systems. Uh, but nonetheless, complex systems are a subset of chaotic systems. So indeed, they are difficult to predict because, uh, and that's the let's say the trivial definition of chaos: a small. Uh, Small differences in the initial state of the system lead to macroscopic and potentially um, exponential divergences of, of these systems. So it's difficult to calibrate for parametric models that uh, predict shoot in the right direction, the estimation. Uh, but uh, yes, um, as uh, you said correctly, uh, uh, these systems are chaotic. And uh, anyone else, anyone knows? Uh, some name from these three people, including. Uh, uh, I guess Warren Buffett else. on the right. Yes. Oh. I can't hear you. So you know this guy on the right. He said Buffett. Sorry. He said Buffett. No, no, that's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a really bad grade. <laughs> no, that, yeah, look at look at what's here. Do you know what's here? This figure on the right. Have you ever seen this image? It is generated through complex numbers, right? Yes, yes. It's an iterative map based on complex numbers. And it's a fractal in particular. And this guy was the, the guy that developed the study of fractals. <clears throat> He's called anyone? Benoit Mendelbrot. And this one is the Mendelbrot set, which takes the name after him. And he is actually a, a, a he worked uh, deeply in finance. Uh, he was not working in machine learning. Uh, he, he, the, the rise of uh, computers, let's say, enabled him to start looking at uh, complex systems and visualize them, and uh, that's what he's most known for popularly. Uh, but he's actually a, a published 
deep papers on uh, financial market and stock markets in particular, um, digging into concepts that are related to actually these sets. So fractional calculus, uh, uh, memory effects, and uh, anomalous diffusion, to mention a few. Uh, the others are a bit older or more related to finance. But yes, this idea is that uh, uh, there are these deep uh, formal concepts in uh, financial markets that and maybe I see your questions. Ah, oh, thanks, John. Um, there is the link for Mandelbrot in the chat. Um, that uh, financial markets allow you to develop and that are really useful to deal with uh, such systems. Uh, machine learning is a perspective, it's a tool to frame these complex uh, systems. Uh, and the complexity of the system is, in some sense, reflecting the complexity of the, sorry, of the, of the model is reflecting the complexity of the system. Um, so, yeah, um, the idea of uh, nonlinear models, let's say, is that uh, given, given, all, given all what we said up to now, this complexity, this uh, high dimensionality, this uh, nonlinearity, uh, we go back to econometrics. Let's say, actually, I saw in your syllabus, you have uh, why econometrics can fail. And uh, after we said all this, we see our uh, least square estimator, and maybe we ask ourselves, maybe we can do better than this. Uh, maybe these estimators are not telling everything about the behavior of the system. And this trivial image is saying this because uh, basically you have different number of uh, linear correlations, so linear metrics measuring distances between uh, distributions. And uh, clearly, I mean, we all see a pattern in the last row. Uh, of course, we see a, a trend in the second row, but we, we understand that there is a difference between the first and the third. And uh, But with linear tools, we are not able to, to, to see them and to do something about them, let's say. Um, this, I believe, is a representation of a, a, a data set we have. Um, uh, in which we are looking at the uh, at the subset of a covariance matrix uh, of a of a financial data set representing the U.S. stock market, and you see that from a pure noise, seemingly so uh, structure, we can use nonlinear functions, and this was done in an exercise looking at uh, kernel machines and the kernel ridge regression. You can see a pattern emerge. Um, the data set representing the system is the same but we are imposing nonlinear structure on this data to make uh, the signal emerge. That's the idea. So that's what happened if you, I mean, after your transformation you have. Uh, yes, basically these two are, uh, I don't know if you digged into the gram matrix, but uh, basically you can, you have a rectangular matrix of features times number of assets. So it's a rectangular matrix of, uh, uh, and uh, and then you can build a gram matrix, which is measuring pointwise the distance between uh, uh, the evaluation of uh, of these features, and you get you end up with something that's like the transpose of a covariance matrix, and uh, at least think of it like that. And uh, and if if the distance is a dot product, then you have something akin to the covariance matrix. Um, right. But if you measure distances non linearly, so you impose a kernel, what's called a kernel. Um, and this kernel is nonlinear, you're able to measure distances in this using what's called the kernel trick. You're basically implicitly mapping your observations in a really high dimensional space characterized by, with, uh, by this nonlinear metric. And then you can evaluate this dot product of observables uh, in this space implicitly. And this makes you compute distances on this. This is a radial basis function in particular. So you're like putting a high dimensional Gaussian on top of your point cloud. And then you, when you measure distance, you measure them along this Gaussian distribution instead of going straight. Uh, but the, the initial data set is the same. So you see it's uh, you, you just have the diagonal and the one on the left. And uh, everything is dark, I guess, around zero, yes. The one on the right, you see a structure that there is clearly a pattern uh, relating variables. I guess I can pass you the ball on this one, John. Yeah, uh, so thank you, Matteo. Obviously you will need some, uh, you have the rough skills and you develop the skills 
uh, that helps to un unveil these patterns, right? Uh, they are rare, they are hard, they are hard to develop, they are time consuming, expensive. Uh, you will need also to add a layer of a specific expertise that is coming from the financial market, but which is not the most difficult, uh, according to me. Uh, and on the top of this, you will also have a layer of alpha decay. You probably heard about this concept where um, even if you find some pattern on the stock market, you finally find a way to look at this complex system and you find consistency and statistical significance and, and, and you decide to develop um, investment strategy on the top of those patterns. Um, these techniques that you have been using will become more and more common and will be developed by other people that will develop this same IP and this will slowly make your alpha, so your information coefficient, decrease in time. And uh, this is happening on the financial market. And especially when, when you think about the concept of strategic crowdness, where more and more people will start to um, develop the same IP and use the same techniques. From that point, you will start to uh, uh, face some problem in terms of capacity of your strategy, and you will face problem like liquidity on the asset that you are trading because many people are using the, the same information uh, that you slippage on some assets, et cetera, et cetera. So this strategic crownness can also be dangerous because you can develop uh, uh, co uh, collinearity and covariance between different uh, uh, institutions and, and, uh, and a different strategy that can cause a, a major uh, uh, um, problem in the, in the, financial, uh, in the financial market. So uh, this is just a kind of a disclaimer from Marco Lopez de Prado. You uh, maybe have heard about this, uh, uh, this uh, researcher that is now uh, leading uh, uh, um, ADIA, which is Abu Dhabi Investment Authority uh, quantitative research team. And he said that I concede, however, that in non-expert hands, machine learning algorithm can cause more harm than good because um, poorly used, it could, it, could, it could lead you to... to uh, to some major issue that we will just uh, that we are going to talk about now. Obviously, this one we can get uh, pretty fast on this one. You probably heard about it, already faced it quite a lot. There is a lot of noise that is inherent to complex system and especially on financial data. Uh, so it's very easy to 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 learn this this noise and act on this noise. Um, Maybe we can move on the next slide, Matteo. Yeah. The non-stationarity yeah. uh, of data um, is also quite a, a, a problem in machine learning where you will um, understand a pattern that are uh, dependent on time and not on the variable that you are trying to, 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 to use. Uh, Matteo, maybe do you want to add yeah. something? On Thank you. Yeah, so on this one, I, I wanted to add that uh, Basically, the way in which we frame problems uh, in our platform is to build, uh, of course, time invariant relationships. We're interested in machine learning models that are invariant. So they have statistical significance, and we can assume them to keep having the same level of performance in the future. These, as, as, an, let's say, uh, as an assumption, the fact that these relationships are time invariant, but we can detect easily. And I think Sean here added a, a slide about the employment uh, in your uh, in university, I think. Yes, in the education of, uh, of the US. Yeah, educational service. Yeah, so basically every summer there is this vacation. So there is this uh, huge seasonality that is explained by one variable, which is just that the university are closed. So there is less job, and less employment in this in this sector. And so basically like this relationship is explained by one variable that then you can use to correct the trend and that you have to use to correct the trend. Otherwise your model could uh, try yeah. to understand that in a way. Yeah, another example is uh, we face regularly is the fact that uh, in the US every three months there is a, an event, let's say there is a, a release of earnings, and, and so there is a, this uh, quarterly uh, seasonality, or there, there is a, a repetition, and, uh, and it's important to be able to, uh, to take it into account to be able then to build on top of the representation of the system a time invariant model that is able to say something consistently all the 12 months of the year. This is the idea. Um, but else, I don't know if you touched this topic in your courses, but uh, uh, even when using, uh, uh, let's say it's not a sufficient condition to use really complicated, highly nonlinear models um, to then work in a 
uh, let's say in a measure that's non-Gaussian. Uh, you can uh, build a really deep neural network and still train it with mean-squared error, uh, which is uh, uh, implicitly assuming that your uh, residuals are following uh, a Gaussian distribution. Uh, uh, this is not necessarily the case, and actually uh, in finance, this is strongly not the case. Uh, distribution, observations of financial returns, and uh, I would say financial features more in general, are uh, close to Gaussian in the sense that they are really noisy. They are uh, unimodal, typically, uh, but still uh, they are so-called fatal. So they are um, characterized by a positive kurtosis, which is the fourth uh, statistical moment of uh, 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 probability density functions. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, I, I guess you are, but the, the mean is determining the center of this unimodal distribution, the standard deviation a bit the scale. The third moment is the skewness, which is characterizing, yes, uh, uh, financial distributions, but it's not as relevant as the kurtosis, which is the fourth moment, and is determining how big the tails are. And, and you see the zoom in of the figure. There is this, uh, there is this histogram in which uh, the so-called tail events are not as improbable as a, a Gaussian assumption would tell us. And uh, on this, I would recommend, uh, 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 in general, the, the cultural work that uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb has been doing on, on rethinking econometrics and approaching uh, statistics, uh, which is basically telling us in this uh, nice book uh, that we really need a strong prior which is God himself, to tell us that the reference distribution is Gaussian, to believe that a 10 sigma event is associated to a Gaussian distribution. If we see a 10 sigma event, and in the financial markets, we see such events uh, pretty regularly, uh, we should maybe think about challenging the Gaussian assumption of, uh, of the models we build. And, uh, and for example, this has implications for uh, risk management. Mm. And there is a series of books from Nicolas Taleb, right, uh, Matteo, which includes a black swan, uh, anti-fragile, yeah. the books, uh, the whole series is, uh, we try to combine a series of books, by the way, that are uh, very interesting that uh, helped us in developing the, the framework. Yeah, maybe I should go back. I don't know what we skipped. Okay, this is a nerdy one, but it's if you're interested in chaos theory, uh, I put it here because basically, what you can do in dynamical system is you say, okay, I have a, a law that's a function of the state and time. And then I can simply map this function in adding a dimension. And I say, okay, my new state is the state plus time itself. And then I'm done because time becomes part of the state. And, uh, but maybe I should shut up because this is too abstract subject and not on point. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, so statistical consequences of Patel is the last one of, uh, Taleb's uh, collection. And then we wanted to recommend uh, machine learning for asset managers. Yeah, from Marco Lopez de Prado. It's a shorter version of the advances in machine learning uh, books that, that uh, try to compile uh, one of the uh, entry, one of the uh, most uh, actionable uh, things that you can find uh, from this book. Uh, definitely, there is this non-Markovian process and the value of uh, building a um, time-aware cross-validation scheme because the autocorrelation of, of data point will create information leak uh, between your training and your test uh, set. So uh, in the training of your model, whatever the, the, the model you are using, if you are uh, working on financial data, this concept of, uh, of, of embargo and removing data between the train and the test set, uh, will avoid this leak of information. And if you don't use that, you may end up with very high uh, 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 information coefficient and you may wonder like why it's the, because there is this autocorrelation. So. Actually, we have a notebook, but I mean, this in general, I would like to share the fact that we have a couple of repositories with some content uh, on GitHub. Uh, I know you are working in, uh, in your Python skills, so. In this one, we tried to show how to perform cross-validation in financial data sets, uh, respecting the, the, this idea, let's say, the, the principle that uh, you cannot do a normal k-fold in which you shuffle data sets, uh, and, uh, and then you perform, a, you define validation sets based on your fold, but you need to be careful about this serial autocorrelation. Uh, 
Uh, so I encourage you to take a look at our GitHub and yeah. So they, they've seen some of those concepts during the class, but it's yeah, it, it's nice that you guys are talking about it because you're actually using. So it's a it's a proof that whatever we are looking in class is also actionable. It's something that it's using practice. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, for us, uh, I guess John can confirm it's uh, it's a matter of uh, uh, I mean, it's everyday uh, yeah, bread. It's uh, wait, I lost my screen. And, and this is also what we, I mean, the second part, we will show you how we can solve this problem in uh, um, a community framework and this competition framework. So, yeah, the low signal to noise ratio, this one uh, uh, is, is, is for you, Matteo, this is your... Yeah, uh, basically, uh, uh, I would say that this subject is more covered by uh, non non data scientists i mean i, I see attention in particular the first book uh, it's uh, it's coming from the field of uh, so called econophysics so there are physicists applying concepts of statistical mechanics to financial markets uh, nonetheless now this idea this uh, this field of random metric theory is contaminating uh, data science and machine learning uh, uh, more in general uh, and actually uh, uh, deep neural networks are now being understood in terms of uh, uh, kernel machine and uh, random matrices, uh, which is an interesting field of research on its own. Uh, but uh, regardless of this, the, the idea of random matrix theory is uh, because we have such a low signal to noise ratio, um, it's, uh, it's more interesting to look at objects that are purely random than to look at deterministic objects. Uh, and then, of course, uh, reality is a, a superposition of uh, of these two words. Uh, then, okay, one can do different assumptions of what does noise mean, what's the reference distribution, is it uh, uh, stationary? There are many problems, but that's why we're trying to present different problematics. And one is being able to understand, to model noise. And uh, random metric theory poses this first question, which is, uh, if I have a really big... Uh, in general, if I have a matrix in which the entries are sampled from a reference distribution, so that it's a random matrix, uh, what can I say about the eigenvalues of this matrix? matrix? And um, this is the most natural question that relates to finance, because when you want to estimate a covariance matrix, you have a set of samples. Uh, the, the number of snapshots you can collect is finite, and usually the dimensions is, uh, is high and actually is comparable to the dimension of, uh, of in time number of snapshots. And this uh, can tell you something about uh, your estimating capabilities, um, regardless of the complexity of the model, assuming some uh, some distribution for the noise. And the, the, the most interesting result, I believe, is this Marsequo Pasteur distribution, which is telling you, if you add an infinite dimensional matrix in which the entries are all Gaussian, then the spectrum of the covariance, which means the distribution of the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix, would converge to this uh, nice blue line. And as I said at the beginning, real observed data lead to an estimated covariance that has a, a spectrum that's a superposition of uh, nice numbers on the right, low, uh, small, sorry, so it, the signal is really low, and this big cloud of, of uh, eigenvalues that are could, that can be explained by pure randomness. So I encourage you to take a look at uh, both books. And the second is particularly interesting for for you guys, probably. Mm. Yeah, there is a, the denoising and detuning techniques that you may have seen also that are also uh, uh, um, discussed in the Marco Lopez de Prado book, Advances in Financial Machine Learning, to correct and remove this noise and, and try to to work in a in a better environment. Last point was spi hacking. This one is uh, is a I say more of a of a of a game theoretic uh, 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 um, pitfall where uh, people are, are feel the pressure to produce results right and and feel the, the need to to find something. And you can see on this graph that um, if you look at the sharp ratio of every iteration of uh, uh, of researchers, uh, you will figure out that this this the more trial you're gonna you're gonna do, uh, the higher the sharp ratio uh, will be, and the more likely the overfitting is is uh, is happening in your 
in your analysis. Um, it's called false strategy theorem, uh, Matteo, if you want to add something. Uh, yeah, in general, I mean, and this is going to lead to the second part of the conversation, that it's important to think when, when uh, performing quantity finance experiments to think of the, the data scientist himself or herself as part of the environment that's part of the experiment. So, uh, and, and the realization, each simulation, each experiment can build, can come out of a knowledge built incrementally, but still it's important to think of it as different realization of the same statistical object so that one can really have an estimation of the expected out of sample performance. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, and I guess this is also motivating the, the, the framework that we're going to introduce you. Maybe John, I can. Yeah, yeah. So often uh, there is this need for privacy with uh, data when you work in financial institution or on a uh, machine learning strategy, and you may end up working in silos where uh, there is a lack of collaboration, and, and each team, these small pods of three to four to five researchers, may have to do all the effort from the data collection to the execution of the strategy and the building of the strategy. It's a tremendous effort. There is a lot of work and duplication of effort and the lack of uh, leveraging the collective expertise right uh, that you could have in a in a in a team uh, that is working together that's one of the tragedy that is currently happening but is also inherent to the fact that there is uh, privacy and financial strategy have incorporated a lot of ip uh, at every steps and so yeah we 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 had a look at all these pitfalls. We really wanted to level the field and make sure that, that we all understand this problem so you guys understand why we build this framework. Otherwise, you will wonder, like, why did they make something so complicated if, uh, you know, if it was so easy to build an investment strategy? And now you, I hope you will get a grasp of, on, I mean, you guys can understand this, whereas we are talking often with people that, that may not uh, understand all these facts. So they, they may be a bit confused when we explain the overall business and how we end up doing what we do. Uh, so now let's try how we tackle every every of these aspects. And um, so the first one, I just want to stress one point is we have this um, game theory uh, approach to solving this problem which is relying on some sort of collective intelligence. Um, so what we are going to do is we are going to rely on, on uh, many individual researchers that don't communicate uh, with each other. Each of these uh, uh, researchers, data scientists, will build an individual model, and then we are going to compare the performance of all this model, and we are going to build ensembles of all this model to try to have a more robust uh, appreciation of this of this system, and the game theory uh, uh, um, is a theory, but there is also some practical example, which is on the next slide. I guess I I, I added a slide, Matteo, on Gasparov versus the world. So I don't know if you guys heard about this experiment. It happens, I think, early two thousand. Microsoft or MSN, I think, was uh, was running this online this first online uh, chess game. And they had this very nice idea to have Gasparov play against uh, the world. So Gasparov back then was the best player. And he played against, I think, tens of thousands of other players. And all the players were using MSN to uh, talk about what is the smartest next move. And they could vote for the next move, what was the smartest move, right? And uh, if you guys know chess, you, you probably know that the difference between um, a grandmaster like Gasparov and a and, uh, and a regular player, no matter the level, is almost, uh, uh, um, I mean, it's a huge, huge uh, uh, distance that there is between this kind of player and normal player. And in the end, um, I get Gasparov won, but he declared it a draw because he could have access to the chat. So he could actually look at what people were saying and it used this information at his advantage to actually won the game. But uh, this game was so perturbing for him that he wrote, a book of a 200 book, a 200 pages book only about this game. It's the longest book that is written about one chess game. And for Gasparov, it was the most beautiful chess game he never played because he faces so much innovation and so much incredible move 
that he, he completely uh, changed his vision of chess and he had to write 200 pages. And that's a very concrete example of the power of collective intelligence when you have many actors that can uh, uh, focus on the same problem. There is a nice movie also about this, Oppenheimer. It's more or less what happened when they try to put all this researcher, you know, in the desert and make them, okay, now we, you guys work together. We break the silo. You don't work in your own university. You don't work in your own investment uh, 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 institution. And you guys need to focus together, work together, and solve this problem together. And it's amazing what we can do if we leverage collective intelligence. And it's an absolute waste right now. There is not a lot of opportunity to uh, leverage this tool. So the first idea at CrunchDAO was we are going to rely on this game theory aspect that by having thousands of researchers, tens of thousands of researchers, tens of thousands of different models, machine learning models. And if we ensemble all this knowledge together, we're going to have something that is unique, that will be so complex to recreate, that will that could face alpha decay in a better way, that will not be crowded because nobody will be able to develop such a big scale uh, project. And that will be also more robust because in the end you have this um, this averaging of all the predictors of all the players that helps uh, having a, a more accurate or not a more, a more accurate, sorry, but a more robust prediction uh, that will be uh, unattainable in other ways. It's a beautiful experience. There is also experience from Francis Galton also uh, um, about measuring the weight of, of uh, um, of a cow, but it's it's the longest ex, um, experiment. Um, but here there is this very nice uh, paper that I recommend you from Rakesh Schaffer. Uh, sorry if I'm if I'm not pronouncing it correctly, but um, he's talking about uh, ways to train models and build ensembles by training models on on a different model and then ensembling, creating this composite model that will be outperforming all the individual models. So let's say that each researcher in the crunch data is coming with a unique techniques, then the ensemble of all this will be more robust, right? And also, Matteo, you were discussing the fact that how many sensors we will need, right, to understand such a complex uh, mm -hmm. system. By having many different minds and many different people that comes from different backgrounds, um, you will have this unique outlook uh, from each individual player. And then in the end, each player is kind of a sensor on this mm -hmm. very complex problem that is functional market. And, and the average of all these sensors will be able to trigger the alert before the avalanche or before uh, a major climate change. Yeah. Yeah. And also yeah. What, what's, let's say, what's enabling this, uh, this perspective of uh, delegating to a, a crowdsource endeavor, the creation of, uh, of machine learning models is that, uh, there is there are there is more possibility to scale the representation of the system so machine learning models are built on a set of features and uh, uh, the less you have to work on digging the microscopic alpha out of these representations the more you can focus on actually uh, building an accurate uh, representation of the system that in as a, as a biased way as possible still uh, you, you can believe there is microscopic alpha there. So uh, it's, uh, uh, as the Prado himself uh, and colleagues uh, put it, the idea is to follow how research labs work uh, in uh, in uh, setting up a, a, a financial machine learning pipeline in which there are, uh, I don't remember the term, but there are uh, steps. Uh, yeah. What's the word, John? I think it's station. station what you're yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, you have different stations, and each station is focused on, okay, here we have to uh, decide where to dig. Here we have to take the dirt out of the land. Here we have to find the micros microscopic gold. And here we have to build a, a nice uh, jewelry. I don't know. This analogy doesn't stand, but uh, you get the idea. Um, so the, the specialization, even though the perspective is, uh, is holistic and everyone knows what's happening throughout the pipeline, enables... Uh, to to avoid this uh, generality that uh, that's been that has been characterizing uh, quantitative finance uh, for 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 reasons we already described I guess but it's enabling a deep uh, uh, special specialization for steps of the of each station that allow for this uh, for this work.
one one of the um, one of the points that we mentioned also before was uh, overfitting the fact that you could also have analysis bias by having this collection and this diversity of of way to look at the problem uh, allows you to to avoid relying on an overfitted model too much uh, and we will see how we track this this reputation etc for a long time what this so what we implemented uh, in the crunch dao we allow people to first combine all their forecasts together so that's crunch dao then two people can train on whatever uh, training window they want and we encourage people to be quite original because by training on different periods you may uh, you know acquire different outlook at the market or some specific market or let's say some seasonality that we failed to remove or to correct some market regime that were unique some particular specificity of this moment that could help in the end one ensemble uh, uh, create a more robust forecast and three we give different label uh, so we are training on how many how many targets do we provide now Matthew? i guess it's almost around six. 15 no, no. Okay. I mean, uh, yeah, as of today, I, I'm already thinking of the next release, but yes, now it's... Uh, <laughs> so that was a pre-release. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but the, the, I mean, internally, we're currently working with, uh, I guess, 15, 16, something like that. Yes. And to here, everyone will uh, train on, on, will choose is um, his particular model may work with some, his IP may work with some kind of target, some kind of label. And uh, we also encourage this, you know, that's why we provide all these targets. Um, and here you can see on this graph the, 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 the projection of the, of the, I guess, the information coefficient of, of, uh, yeah, so. uh, of, the, um, of the predictor that we receive from the community. Yeah, you see it, the diversity of it, it almost looks like a, a Monte Carlo simulation, but you get the idea by combining all those models, you, you, you have something more robust. Because in the yeah. end, I mean, well, the last day, yes, yeah, sorry, Matthew, go. Sorry, now about the labels you said, I think it's interesting to uh, basically uh, adding all these labels is uh, saying we, we are not sure about framing the problem in a in a supervised learning with these specific labels. So it's increasing the variance of the problem statement. And then the goal of the of the machine learning task of the competition is actually to bring back a lot of bias and saying, okay, this is what's going to happen. And so having multiple labels uh, enables to, to to look at the problem in different ways. So to expand the, the the variance of the problem statement and then each machine learning model has a strong bias and then again this ensemble smooths out these biases again uh, to have a the, the best risk adjusted information coefficient uh, mm -hmm. uh, i have a couple of questions guys yeah oh, just on this so oh, let me let me see if everyone is on track so we talked about ensemble in this class when we introduced random forests or algorithm like Xubus, that's an idea of an ensemble, ensemble of just a class of models. But as I told you, on the build ensembles, you need different types of models, which is what you're doing. So essentially, you see the, these are the information coefficient of different users of that platform. And every user can use a different model. You, don't, you guys don't even know what is the model, right? Because you, you don't see what, what yeah, is correct. It? Actual model, so you you could participate in that competition, build your own model. And they will just see the results of the model, so they don't know actually what is the model that produced those results. But then they work on creating an ensemble, so they put together the prediction of different models. That said, I wanted to ask: when you talk about ensembling, this is just on your perspective. It's not something that the user is going to do. The user is just working on a data set and producing some forecasts, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And well, we have, we have many players that are, uh, and that are using these ensembling techniques, right? They will yeah. by themselves also uh, using, you know, training on different target, different uh, uh, time windows, use different algorithm, uh, 10 uh, LGB with some linear model, with some mixed boost and combine all these uh on the f into a weighted average uh, that is following i don't know whatever the 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 the, the recent result they had uh, some users get quite sophisticated on that i mean you're free to to go deep yeah that makes sense at the end of, of the day we'll become an ensemble of ensembles 
Yeah, exactly. Yes. I mean, you can you can layer the cake as much as you like. I mean, the, the idea is, uh, uh, I mean, if one person had the resources of 50,000, but that's kind of the idea. If, if there is a Kasparov, there's no need for 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 a crowd. Okay. Uh, but if you is... have a crowd of uh, Kasparovs, yeah. Then... I mean, I don't want to say that the assumption is that you're going to have many weak learners, but like average learners. You could say that uh, yes. Uh, I mean, then it's also a job of the of the ensembler that doesn't have to be necessarily a, a trivial uh, ensemble average. Uh, that the, it can have a bias. The ensembler itself can have a bias. His bias can be uh, low, let's say, but still one can do assumptions on the way which to optimally uh, combine uh, weak learners, mm -hmm. medium learners. As you said, I like this term. Um, and there is. A concept Matteo of diversity of the of the learner uh, trying to get uncorrelated uh, um, uh, predictors you know so this will be in the way we frame the problem like we have to give the right direction but we don't want to give too much of a direction right that's why this many label because we don't know how to solve this problem the guy that will be able to solve it perfectly uh, uh, is this hypothetic Gasparov, right? That we are all trying yeah. to, that we are all trying to, 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 uh, to, to fight. And um, so we had to frame also this into the problem. And Matteo had this brilliant uh, uh, idea of incorporating the risk uh, framework that we are using to push more uh, correlation. We, we talk a bit about that uh, later, um, but there is plenty of way to do this, yeah. Um, yeah, so about the the description of the, the problem statement, let's say. Uh, uh, but yeah, actually, I never thought about uh, the, the risk framework. As a, I think it would, would be interesting to think of a training algorithm, uh, even in XGBoost, let's say, in which each weak learner is uh, is informed about the prediction of, uh, of the other weak learners. So there is this kind of uh, swarm dynamics of weak learners. That are adapting to each other. Uh, I believe, uh, uh, I mean, tr traditional boosting algorithms don't ha have a kind of a silo approach between uh, weak learners, which are then combined all together. But uh, swarm optimization characterizing the evolutionary algorithms, they are still heuristics, but there, there is this idea in which the optimal step of uh, one weak learner, one particle in the swarm, is a function of the of the positions in the fitness landscape of uh, of the n minus one uh, particles, um, mm -hmm. and with what John mentioned, the idea is that uh, we already have a, a risk framework. We already have a, a data generating process, so it's not a machine learning model, but we have this vector appearing to us, and so we can. What we're doing is informing all the other data generating processes about the outcome of this one, so that they can adapt and. Uh, and the idea is mm. to to push these uh, interactions forward. Um, mm. And on this on this uh, boost uh, and silo approach, that's true. You try to recreate the silo, and you are algorithmically using techniques like uh, bagging, for example, trying to uh, you know create what I was talking about this um, decision of training on the different part of the data or choosing different features, and you are algorithmically doing that, but. By doing it algorithmically, you're not doing it as well as a crowd of human would be able to do it because they will be selecting features in a way, uh, let's say a physicist will select the feature. Then you have this mathematician that will select this feature in a different way. And you will have this pure data scientist that will just throw this, uh, you know, this deep neural net on the on the on on all the data and won't really care and just will have a different thing. So. Actually, these techniques already exist uh, algorithmically. What we try to do is to, is to make it even more uh, powerful using a real crowd of human that will do this job more precisely. And yeah, so I guess the, this is how we present the problem, Matteo. Yeah, it's. Okay, can I go? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, the, the, the idea is basically to, to frame the, the financial machine learning problem as a cross sectional uh, regression problem, so supervised learning. Uh, it's a cross-sectional uh, time series. So as we mentioned, uh, the goal is to interact with a system of uh, assets, let's say of financial vehicles, 
um, that are evolving in time, but nevertheless, the, the features describing the system are uh, are processed in a way that makes the problem a cross-sectional one. Um, so uh, basically, you you have a in general a varying number of asset ID appearing in each uh, cross section, which is associated to time, not necessarily uniform, but it's associated to time. And uh, and then a number of features that uh, that is constant and it's evolving in time. And so you have these uh, these relationships which are not necessarily purely linear. So everything is not in the covariance, uh, not necessarily. Um, and then associated to this, you have a number of uh, labels. So financial data labeling, uh, you want to uh, build uh, vectors that describe the future behavior of the system and uh, that you believe can be modeled by supervised learning problem based on the feature space um, and the label definition. Um, one important point, I guess, is that this uh, data set is obfuscated. Uh, which means that uh, it maintains the statistical properties of the original uh, uh, data set. Uh, let's say that the general field of, uh, of uh, privacy preserving machine learning uh, is called uh, differential privacy. Um, but the idea is to be able to share this amount of information without then uh, uh, people being able to bypass uh, this uh, IP that's collected by financial institutions throughout even decades, you know, and uh, and still be able to crowdsource uh, this uh, financial machine learning expertise that not necessarily lives inside these uh, financial institutions and get the best of both worlds, let's say. I have a question on that, Matteo. Uh, do you see a value in the fact that the data are anonymized? You see a value. I mean, they're obviously anonymized because you need to protect the the data source. But do you see a value in terms of user being less biased because they don't know what the features are, so they can just focus on statistical properties. So they they cannot start with their assumption. They cannot have priors because there's no prior to have. You don't know that. John was making this point uh, one hour ago when we were preparing slides. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. He wants to answer this, but uh... it is. Yeah, that's exactly the case. And that's why it's um, I mean, you have these people that have amazing mathematical uh, uh, tools, you know, and by obfuscating the problem and making it a pure mathematical problem. Yeah. 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 Did we lose John? Yes, we lost John, I think. Oh, sorry. Can you guys we'll, hear me? We lost you for yes. a second. Yes. Okay. Back. Yeah, I would say that 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 the, um, we have these people, and in this room also, you are developing unique mathematical tools, right? And you're going to be facing problems that are financial problems that uh, many people have thought about before, and they already had a lot of idea, right? And you don't want to end up in this place where you will pass by the same ideas and them because it's more obvious, etc. By making it a pure mathematical problem, we are sure that you use the cognitive part of your brain that is the most skills to solve this problem, which is mathematical skills, right? And we make sure that we contain you in this problem. It's purely mathematics. You cannot understand. It's like um, how to how to um, orientate in a sea when it's completely dark in the night with, without any tool, you know? And we, you know, you can use trigonometry and you will you could even be better at orienting orientating yourself in the sea using trigonometric than actual uh, eyes or your first sense, which will be the first reflex, you know, like, okay, there's this island over there, we want to go there, maybe, maybe using uh, mathematics, you will be much better at this tool. And this is why we frame it like that. We also don't want people to use other kind of data that they may inject by knowing the ID. So let's say you are, you are this big fan of NVIDIA, right, which we all are at this particular <laughs> moment. Uh, and you will be, you know, sending this prediction about NVIDIA is going to, to kill it and it's going to be a great stock in the future. So you will be ranking this, again, this stock using your bias and, and the wrong cognitive part of your brain, which we don't want. And also preparing the data may be very tricky and etc. We really want to create this station where we took care of everything. I mean, the financial institution that prepared this data set for you know 
know his job very well. They know their job very well. They've been done that. They've been doing that for 20 years. So when they give this data set to the community, your station is only about building a performant machine learning models. That's it. You don't have to think about financial concept. You don't have to think about execution. You don't have to think about liquidity. You have just this exact problem. Try to rank this universe of stock in the most efficient way. And yes, that's... We have 15 minutes. Yes. Oh, okay. Let's try 15, you said, Alessio? Sorry. 15 or 15? 15. 15. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have so we are looking at this problem as a cross-sectional way, cross-sectional forecast problem. I don't know if you heard about that. So in each time we rank the stock and the universe ID, and then we will use the Spearman rank correlation, uh, which allow you to see the correlation of your predicted ranking with the actual realized ranking. And we will score people according to that, and which is used also in the, in the objective function of the people participating in the tournament. Not always, some people get more fancy, some less, whatever, everyone is different on that. And then we will be longing, um, uh, we will be taking long position on the top of the ranking and short position on the bottom of the ranking while trying to hedge risk in a, in a more uh, uh, complex way. But the idea there, once you can rank the stock properly, then you can develop a whole range of investment strategy. And yeah, and one interesting point here, I guess, is that people, uh, as we said, there are different labels you can train on, even though the actual market is the same for everyone. Uh, in the same way, even though the problem statement is the same for everyone, uh, the, we see people training models on different loss functions, loss landscape. The main reason is, for example, the starting reason, let's say, is that spearman rank correlation is not differentiable. So there is no well-defined gradient, or form gradient in the sense. Uh, mm -hmm. And so people sometimes, I think in the majority of the cases, use a different loss function uh, in the training. Then, okay, the cross-validation is another subject, but uh, the training is performed on some other fit last landscape that is akin to the actual one. And this brings, again, a lot of uh, diversity and originality in, uh, in developing models and arriving at the undefined state of the model. And if I can add one more thing is if you try to predict the exact uh, return on investment on a particular securities, this is a very noisy problem. It's a very complex problem. By trying to rank stock, you make the problem simpler, right? You just try to understand the relative performance. Is NVIDIA going to be better than uh, Intel at the next quarter? And then you look at this problem. It's simpler for a model to, to, to understand. So I guess point two is exactly what uh, the, the, the question we had before about the, the, the possibility of uh, not having domain expertise and removing bias that uh, can be associated to to the field. Uh, I think this we discussed and we can go quickly if we have questions. Uh, at the end, it's all about coordination. Yes, the goal is to figure out what you want people to do and try to frame the problem such that everyone can uh, coordinate. It's always been a coordination yeah. problem. And this um, is where we will look for tonality uh, and originality, right? Yeah, as, uh, as uh, Jean anticipated, uh, uh, basically following the machine learning uh, station, there is an optimal decision making, uh, a capital allocation step that has to make a decision based on the outcome of this crowdsource endeavor, which is building on other stations. Um, this capital allocation has some constraints, uh, which, I mean, we're coming back from this world of uh, abstract uh, statistical learning, and we have physical definitions of risk, let's say, which are not necessarily statistical. So uh, we are not just interested in avoiding features that uh, statistically uh, are risky from a machine learning perspective. We are so interested in uh, some more, uh, yeah, non statistic based, I would say, uh, fundamental based uh, definition of risk. And so there is need to be a, there needs to be a dialogue between the capital allocator and the supervised learning uh, in a way that the problem statements are aligned and the incentives are aligned. Uh, so on this, uh, we again have a notebook. I encourage you to take a look at, uh, let's say, for a particular problem we have in our platform, 
what is the problem statement and why there is such a problem statement, combining uh, portfolio theory with uh, supervised learning. And we, we, we discussed this, um, this notion of uh, um, alpha decay and strategic runs, right? And if you go to the previous slide, uh, Matteo, they have been, you heard about the CAPM and the fact that the return can be explained by the market, by the industry of the stock, et cetera. And you and some common sources of return, for example, the moment of many people are already doing this in the market. So it's highly probable that um, this space is already crowded. So you're going to try to to avoid ending up in this place and looking for orthogonality. So um, something that is not correlated to this kind of predictors. And so Matteo is correcting uh, the prediction, for example, of the data scientists to make sure that they are not ending up in catching on or loading on market or momentum, even if this was not in the data set originally, you know, and the data has been maybe even corrected for this kind of seasonality. It's so strong in the market that it can't come back. And so we try to correct this information, even in the training loop, uh, which is, I think, absolutely uh, fascinating. So have a look at this notebook. It's, it's very interesting. Can you share the yes. slides afterwards? Yeah, sure. Yeah, great. Of course. Thank you. And on the last part, maybe on the infrastructure that we developed. So all the people that participate in, in, in our uh, tournaments there are, for example, this is what we developed for Adia Lab. So the laboratory of uh, Abu Dhabi Investment Authority participants are uh, uh, uploading the code and they, are, they have to comply in an, infra, in, a, how to say, in an interface that is composed of two functions, which is train and infer. Once the code is online, we will uh, we have 3,000 GPUs that will be used to retrain the model every week to test the model on live data because this curse of overfitting um, can be tested in using out of sample data, but uh, the only way to truly uh, uh, trace your model and test this is confronting it to live data. And so this is what we will do when we are consistently giving a feedback uh, to the player and to, to its model. Um, also, sometimes the data could incorporate some leak, you know, some data provider, for example, could give you some information or change the data such that uh, your model feel that it finds something that in the end, once you're going to be live trading or live executing these models, you will figure out that it's feeding on something that doesn't exist anymore. And so to fight this two mechanism, we, we are running models against live data. And this is it. Thank you very much. This is a question slide in which we invite you to also join the platform and, and try to compete. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the, uh, this slide was, uh, was uh, I think we should uh, give back to Cesar. But this slide is, this mem is from Jonathan Larkins from Columbia Investment, uh, uh, um, um, Investment Fund. And it's it's absolutely I think it's very incorporating the vision we have. It's um, that if you are playing in this kind of game and, and if we manage to really en incarnate this, this vision that we have, uh, we will probably find a way to never have to work and we will just have this model running for us, you know. Uh, that's, that's the absolute vision. And you are part of it. So feel free to come, join, push your model, let it run and, and hopefully uh, you are the one <laughs> Do we have questions? Yep. Yeah, we have one here. Yeah. Uh, hello. So, uh, my question is about the ensemble of um, the models. Um. So, are they just are the forecasts related based on their like performance, or it's you know, more complicated than that? So, it would be helpful if you could talk more into the. Did you hear the question? Uh, no, not really. Could you? So the that? question is about the way you engineer the ensemble. So essentially, if it's just a <laughs> aggregation based on performance, or if something more complex, I, I already know the answer, but maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that. If if it's based on performance, so basically, yeah, I mean, how you engineer the ensemble for? I mean, um, yeah. So let's say. Uh, high level, uh, the idea is that uh, because the, the incentive of uh, 
of the of the machine learning model is to build a, a relationship which are strong in a linear sense. Uh, it's it's uh, it's useful to think at this level of the pipeline uh, to to think of linear relationships and to focus on uh, 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 time series aspects. Let's say uh, so. Uh, the, the idea is to monitor the performance of each machine learning model in time and to and to build models to to define optimal weights for the for combinations that are optimal uh, the, the focus is uh, as i said uh, on uh, linear models at this level of abstraction but uh, the way in which this inference is built is looking at the time series aspect also the as john briefly mentioned at the at the originality so let's say the, the inner dependence of all these uh, predictors mm -hmm. um, and, and of course in the performance absolute performance it's and we cannot uh, answer for the people that are customer of the platform so we also have this capacity for example Adia Lab, when they come and they provide us with a data set since we have this differential privacy uh, that is uh, involved we have no idea what is in sample about neither you know as a on the platform, we also don't know what it is about. We don't even know what is a target about. And we are sending back forecast about something that we don't know basically what is and how it has been engineered. But let me tell you that behind this data set, there is, uh, uh, if you accumulate the, the years of, of experience, uh, there is quite some IP. And of course, this cannot be leaked. So we have absolutely no idea. We are just here to build the most robust model and and yeah, that's. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Um, since you guys are uh, down in the like, how, how do you guys like, distribute the tokens to multiple countries? So the, the question is since you are a DAO, uh, how do you uh, envision the distribution of the tokens? So how, how does the DAO uh, part work? In your company. Yes, so uh, the goal is to, um, so first the token is used at the governance level. So uh, when you are participating, um, the better your model is, the more reward you're gonna, your more token you're gonna win. And you can use this token to either uh, sell this token and get back uh, actual dollar. Or you can, um, and we are ensuring the, our own liquidity uh, about this. So there is always uh, the possibility to uh, resell your token if you don't want to keep the crunch token. But the crunch token is used also on the governance level. So all the decisions that are critical for the system uh, are taken uh, using uh, on-chain voting mechanism. Now, there is, a, um, there is not a clear distinction between the fact of voting everything and being completely decentralized and uh, voting only the critical things. There is, a, a, I think, it's not all black or white. We need to find the right balance between decentralization and actually making things happening because centralization is sometimes good to you know move forward. So we use this token on the most critical uh, decision at the moment. And of course, it's a way to get re rewarded on the, on, the, on the top of your effort. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question, eventually. One more questions? All right, I'll slide, reach the end. Thank you so much, guys, it was, uh, it was very insightful. Thank you for having us.